Playing Overwatch in middle of the night is quite a unique experience. In one moment you're just playing your regular FFA waiting for your DPS queue to pop and suddenly you find yourself recruiting players to your kingdom and inadvertently end up creating a narrative that is somehow more compelling than all of the official Overwatch media combined. Who says you have to wait for Overwatch 2 in order to get some story content? It's right here, hidden in plain sight. Well, I'm happy to report that I have officially and royally busted my sleep schedule. But it's not all bad, because thanks to this crippling deficit to my mental and physical well-being, I had the privilege of of exploring Overwatch in an entirely new light. By which I mean, through the lack thereof. Trust me when I say that Overwatch turns into a completely different game once the clock strikes midnight, and today I want to show you what exactly I mean by that. Because for many of you who are well-functioning members of society, attaining this type of experience might be outside of your possibilities. Now, we all know that no good decisions are made past midnight, so you're probably not surprised when I tell you that I had the brilliant thought process of not only playing Overwatch when no sane human being should be playing video games, but also deciding to queue for the most popular role in the known universe. Well that seems like a very backwards kind of decision at first, it allowed me to finally make use of a feature that alpha flex chads like myself don't usually take advantage of. Naturally, playing tank and support most of the time allows me to largely skip queue times altogether, so now that I signed up to throw on DPS, I can finally try out some of the side activities that other DPS players get to enjoy while waiting to find a match. And honestly, playing deathmatch while waiting in queue to play DPS could probably warrant a story of its own, especially at night, and we will get into that in a bit, but much like an other games, there are many different ways of approaching the content on offer. Opting for the non-violent option of simply playing music for the amusement of others allowed me to befriend this random Brigitte player that not only danced along, but also played the bouncer for my club to eventually beat up a Hanzo that simply was not dressed for the part. Your sacrifice will be remembered. While the average insomniac identifies this as an opportunity to solo old others who unironically play Doomfist and FFA, I much prefer the social aspect of the game. Sure, there will be times where somebody's going to test your patience and see how close to the sun they can fly, but let's say that a lot of those types have learned their lesson that night. Usually, I'm the one trying to make new friends, but for rude individuals like this soldier, I will make an exception and show them that their high school hallways are not the only environment where they can get beat up. But other times, wonderful friendships can form, like between this Ana player and I. Naturally, her immediate reaction was trying to fend for her life, but when she realized that I had no interest in robbing the elderly, she actually assisted me in taking out the enemy tracer. In turn, I helped dealing with her much younger and much more attractive sniper counterpart and even went as far as playing her body guard, fending off another Ana player that was threatening her for Ana's supremacy. Nothing could get between her and me and we successfully managed to not only claim the top spots in the lobby but also preserve our newfound friendship. But obviously it isn't all fun and games in the land of the sleep deprived, some would even argue that the real suffering only begins once that queue finally pops and you get pulled out of the loving arms of the FFA lobby. Well, not for me anyway, because who says you can't still solo people in quick play? And especially when playing late at night, usage of ultimates becomes very questionable. The first wasted ultimate after winning a team fight could be considered a fat finger. The second one is definitely a meme, and at this point, the third one is being used in solidarity. But if you think that we needed any of these ultimates to win the game, then you would be solely mistaken, because at 3am, we simply don't adhere to your social constructs. Oh, you think that Tracer counters Zenyatta? Well, not at 4.27 in the morning, pipsqueak. Better go take a nap before trying to challenge me. Apparently, past 2am, I am getting anime-esque bullet time dodging abilities. I mean, how else do you explain this Hanzo not landing a single shot on me? Oh, you think there was a one-off? Well, then what about this clip in which I'm single-handedly stalling the cart on Junkertown, gracefully dodging every single bullet coming out of Orisa's magazine? My anime powers allow me to buy my team enough time to actually come back to recontest the objective and eventually come out victorious. Like, I'm not joking. The game plays very differently in middle of the night, and not necessarily in a bad way. Some of you may be thinking that playing FFA is what you do while waiting to get to the content of an actual match of Overwatch, but at 4 in the morning, FFA is the content. Especially when you queue SDPS. There is more social intrigue in Overwatch death matches than in freaking Game of Thrones. Case in point, Bandit. I found this lonely Reinhardt vibing in the basement and where most of you DPS fans out there see a fat sack of ultimate charge ready to bust open, I saw an opportunity. To signal that I am a friendly player, I not only crouched towards him, but also immediately jumped in to protect him from the thirsty tracer. I died numerous times trying to fight for him and after all that effort, surely Bandit realized that I just wanted to be his friend. I returned to the basement once again and cleaned up the two rats that still tried to pluck my Reinhardt for remaining HP, and after that display of chivalry, he allowed me to take cover behind his shield. A strong bond began to form between the two of us, and I knew that we had something special on our hands. Pattern recognition must have not been Lucio's strong suit, because while he tried to mess with us and died horribly as a result, the Tracer finally learned to leave us alone. But more enemies would come to fight us for the spot in the basement, and even seeing the McCree get decimated did not stop this Lucio from trying to mess with us once again. Friendly fire is a very real issue in those types of scenarios, and while we managed to get rid of Leah, Sorbet on McCree 
came back to bring bloody vengeance upon us. I arrived just too late and saw my best friend get killed right before my eyes, but such an insult would not go unanswered. I cleaned up Sorbet and stopped having any chill, meaning I pulled out my dragon blade to get rid of that annoying music man. You can wall ride all you want, but you just delay the inevitable, buddy. We had successfully reclaimed the basement and we were not planning to give it up. Impressed with our sheer determination, the previously hostile Tracer decided to join our ranks. I may have been a little suspicious at first, but eventually accepted to in our kingdom. Sorbet, however, would not be granted such a benefit of the doubt. Leah, now having swapped to a McCree, signaled that he finally learned his lesson and was now trying to join us as well. Reluctantly, we allowed him to bolster our troops and it appeared our grip onto this basement was only getting stronger. It seemed like Sorbet wanted to join us as well, but I was yet to get over my trust issues, so I executed him on the spot, while this random Widowmaker sneakily made a way into our ranks. The next time Sorbet came around, I nodded at him, signaling that I finally believed his motives to be true of heart, and together we would be defending this basement to the very end. But suddenly, we found ourselves stunned. Betrayal? Amongst our own lines? Heresy, I say! Surely that must have been an accident! But when the second stun landed, I knew we had made a mistake. These McCree players are not to be trusted, and God knows who else has been conspiring with the two of them. I saw it fit to dispose of the traitors and reform the order with the only person I knew I could trust myself. A horrific bloodbath ensued, not only eliminating everyone involved in the Order of the Basement Dwellers, but also innocent bystanders that have merely been passing by. My hands, now stained with blood, were no longer fit to rule this kingdom, so I gave up on this once sacred place and had to live with the knowledge that I betrayed my best friend. But even if roleplaying isn't your thing, some people are surprisingly talkative around this time of night. It happened on more than one occasion that I could have full-on conversations not only with my own team, but actually with everyone in the entire lobby. All in all, it feels much more chill and mellow. 4am is that time of night where you can pick up any character in the roster and have a realistic chance of doing well on them. 4am is the time where Roadhogs are getting gold healing medals on Paris. And 4am is also the time where Winston suddenly becomes a viable hero pick. So if you have the possibility to go full nuclear on your sleeping schedule, to experience this very unique version of Overwatch, just don't. Don't do that, it's not worth it, you're going to ruin your life in more than one way, and for what? A stupid meme you can post online for Twitter Cloud? Nah oh man, why would you do that when you could just subscribe to my channel instead? Get all the fun parts of being a degenerate without actually being a degenerate. And all of that for the low low price of nothing! Just hit that sub button, ring the bell, and validate my existence by smashing that like button as hard as I'm going to smash into my bed once I'm done recording this video. Thanks for watching everyone, more memes to come soon, and have a good one! Peace!